On a road trip with his family, late at night in California's Sierra Nevada mountains, Hal Halderman saw something. As we come around through an S-turn, we lit this thing up that was standing under a tree right on the edge of a road. The creature was taller than the van. Taller than the van. Well over seven feet tall, he thought, and absolutely gigantic. Massive upper body, big, huge triceps hanging down off the arms, and it was very light colored, almost white, but kind of dirty, maybe gray. He shot right past it before slamming on the brakes, bringing his giant van to a standstill. I said to my wife, I said, do you see that? And she goes, yes. And I said, I got to go back. And so when I started to throw it into reverse, she freaked out and started screaming and clawing on me and wouldn't let me go back. The sound of her panic woke their three little kids who were sleeping in the back seat. What was it, Dad? What was it? And I said, I think we just saw a Bigfoot. He goes, go back, go back, go back. And my wife's just crazy screaming. And I didn't go back. And that's, that's mostly what he said me. I want to see it again. This happened 28 years ago, and it still gnaws at him. As a matter of fact, sometimes I feel in ways it's ruined my life. Hal wasn't someone who believed in Bigfoot, but that one sighting changed everything. It took over his life. He moved his family from Arizona to the Pacific Northwest and kept trying to find the creature. But he hasn't seen anything since. Not a glimpse. Hal's not alone. Thousands of others have reported seeing Bigfoot and become consumed by the search. To me, it was just a big mountain gorilla, except it didn't have canines. It had big teeth like chiclets. When my son and I were driving up the road, this animal crossed in front of us, and I had to stop the truck. What I thought in my head was orangutan, a baby orangutan. But this is in Canada, not exactly prime orangutan habitat. And so I, I started thinking, yeah, that was probably a baby Bigfoot. Some of these stories are decades old, and the people telling them live hundreds of miles apart. I've hung out with them on weekend camping trips and at seminars, and spent time talking to them one-on-one. -on -one. And for the most part, I really don't think they're nuts. All of them have seen something that they can't explain any other way. I'm Laura Krantz, and this is Wild Thing, a series about Sasquatch science and society, the search for Bigfoot, and why we want so badly for it to be real. Eyewitness accounts, these stories of people's personal Bigfoot encounters, they're completely fascinating. While I believe that many of these witnesses saw something, I also know that their stories are hard to verify. So did my cousin Grover Krantz, one of the world's most respected Bigfoot researchers. At a Sasquatch conference way back in 1978, he spoke about his hesitation in relying on eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses can be interviewed, studied, cross-examined, but only by a handful of curious scientists. Very soon, they will decide to shut up or else change their stories. I found this tape of Grover in the Smithsonian's archives, and it illustrates how wary he was about these stories. But his papers also contained a list of supposed Sasquatch sightings. So it seems like he couldn't completely dismiss them either. For each sighting, he'd note the date, the location, the name of the witness, and whether he thought the stories were legit. He'd put a big red X by most of them, once he'd checked out and that didn't pass muster. But about a handful had question marks or a maddening maybe scribbled next to them. And that's it. No additional information. If he took more detailed notes, they're not with the rest of his papers. Diane Horton, Grover's fourth wife, we met her in the first episode, she remembers collecting eyewitness accounts with him. He also got testimonials in the mail. And he had hundreds of those letters. With a brief little story, I was out by the barn and this Bigfoot thing walked by. But he didn't keep any of those either. Horton says he didn't think they were sufficient enough evidence on their own, although he still checked them out, just in case. I can see the reasoning there. Many of these accounts probably seem suspect from people who weren't all that familiar with the woods or with questionable claims about UFOs. But every once in a while, there are some stories told by intelligent, rational people who have seen something so strange, so inexplicable, that Sasquatch seems to them to be the only possible explanation. Like this one from John Mayanzinski. 
He was working as a wildlife biologist doing research for the U.S. Forest Service out in the wilds of Wyoming. He was camping and he turned in for the night, but woke up to unsettling sounds right outside his tent. I could hear it breathing before I heard anything else. And it got close enough to cast a shadow and there was a rising moon that was almost full. The shadow was of something like a bear and I thought it had to be a bear. You could see hair, tufts of hair in the, in the silhouette on the tent. Mayanzinski spends a lot of time in the woods and he knows tons about bears. He's not a novice outdoorsman by any stretch. My first thought was to scare it and make it go away. So I did the yell and the hit with the back of the hand. I hit something soft and it ran off back behind the tent, but I could still hear it breathing. And then it came back the second time, did the same thing. I hit it with the back of my hand again and made a really loud yelping sound. He hit a bear, or what he thought was a bear, twice. And it scared it again and it went back behind those trees, came back a third time. This time, the silhouette was over the top of the tent, and it looked like it was walking on two legs. He thought the bear had grabbed onto the branch of the lodgepole pine that stuck out over his tent. So BAM! He whacked it again. And this time, I hit something hard as a rock. And when I, as soon as I did, this shadow came over the top of the tent, and it was a silhouette of a hand that was about twice the width of mine with an opposed thumb and hair between the fingers. Holy shit. That's no bear. That mental image burned in my memory because bears don't have that kind of a paw. And it was bigger than a bear's paw, and it didn't have claws, it had fingers and then opposed them. As the creature skulked off, Mayanzinski abandoned his tent and retreated to the fire, bolt awake. It hadn't gone away. He could still hear it breathing behind a nearby line of trees, and he still had no idea what it was. The thought of Bigfoot had not even entered my mind at that point. I'm trying to put myself in his shoes, all spun up on adrenaline and fear, palms sweaty, hands shaking, stomach churning. The night seems very dark and full of terrors. No way I'm sleeping. But then, once things calm down again and the adrenaline levels drop, I can imagine feeling a little tired. And that's what happened to Mayanzinski. It was 2 a.m., he'd hiked all day and had been up for hours. And after a bit, he started to doze off. I don't know how long I was out there, but it was probably close to an hour when I was jolted awake. Something hit the ground and I didn't see anything. And then I saw a pine cone fall out of a tree. I thought that explained the first noise. But then another one came at him, and another one, and another. And they weren't falling out of any tree. Something was throwing them. And over the course of 10 minutes, about 20 pine cones came in my direction. They all landed around the fire and around me, sitting there with my sleeping bag draped over my head. Bears don't have opposable thumbs, and they don't throw things. The creature, whatever it was, eventually shuffled off. Mayanzinski opted to stay close to the fire until dawn. When he went looking for animal tracks the next morning, he didn't find any. Too many pine needles, not enough mud. The encounter puzzled him. So when he got back to civilization, he quietly mentioned it to his boss at the Forest Service. And that's where it got interesting, because he suggested the idea that what I had was a Bigfoot encounter. And apparently, Mayanzinski wasn't the only person to have had a sighting in that area around the same time. And he said that there were many people while I was in the mountains that had reported seeing a large ape-like critter running around, and it was scaring people. Mayanzinski's story raises the hair on the back of my neck. These aren't your typical fisherman's tall tales of landing a marlin when you actually just caught a minnow. They're not masterfully told, and many have been shared so many times that they sound kind of flat. They don't have a lot of zing. It's like they're trying to avoid sensationalizing it. Honestly, though, that kind of makes them seem more real. These eyewitnesses are less concerned about wowing their audience than they are about remembering every detail accurately. 
it was bigger than a bear's paw and it didn't have claws, it had fingers and then a post thumb. Their silhouettes were enormous. I mean, they, they, they were built like bodybuilders. No visible neck, very broad shoulders, barrel chested, tapered waist. Because it wasn't running, but it steps 42 to 48 inch stride. So it covered the ground quite rapidly. Getting a glimpse of Bigfoot seems to change your life forever, and it can sometimes lead to obsession. Mayanzinski changed his career path because of it. We'll hear more on that in a future episode. And just look at Hal Halderman, the guy whose story we heard at the beginning of this. He picked up and moved states for Bigfoot, and he says the search has ruined his life. All he wants is vindication, to prove to the world that, yes, he did see Bigfoot. He's not bonkers. But so far, no dice. Imagine how frustrating that would be. Another guy I talked to, Derek Randalls, he claims having a sighting is akin to when somebody dies. You know, you go through different levels of mourning and, you know, you're, you're, you're sad and then you're angry and then it's, it's just all you, you evolve through these different emotions. This is the same thing with a sighting. You know, you spend a, a period of time in denial and then you spend a period of time trying to prove it to everyone because I'm not crazy. And then you get to a point where it's like, pff, screw everyone. Screw everyone because he knows what happened. And we were about about eight miles up from the trailhead and then about probably a quarter mile up off the trail. Randall's is a compact, solidly built man's man. He's the owner of a landscaping company, and he's also the co-founder of the Olympic Project, the group that has access to those big ground nests we looked at in the first episode. But in 1985, he was just a guy going camping with his buddies in the Olympic National Forest. And as we were taking our backpacks off and unrolling sleeping bags and tents, we heard a large crash. And everybody looked up in that area. And my, my dad was a hunter. I grew up being a hunter. And it just sounded to me like an elk taking off or a bear bolting or whatever. So we're looking up to the left. And all of a sudden, here comes a rock. And then, like the pine cones, another rock came in. And another. And we started picking our stuff up. And another rock came to the left of us. And now we're in full-blown panic. It's getting dark. We're off the trail. We're eight miles up. And then the rock started coming to the right side of us. And so we turned, and the three of us just bolted down this ridge. And it was a pretty good angled ridge. We're running back towards the trail. And I got about 10 steps in. Remember that I had a pistol in my backpack. So I skidded to a stop, reached into my backpack, and grabbed my pistol. And just in a split second, I looked back to where we just ran from. And it had come out of the timber line. It was just standing there staring at me. And it was just time stopped. Was it Bigfoot? I mean, it freaked me out. <laughs> I was like, what? And it just seemed to be swaying back and forth. And it was probably seven to eight feet tall, enormous, two arms, two legs, just looking at me. Wild Thing fans, I have a serious message for you. If you're not already talking to your kids about aliens, it's probably time to start. Just this year alone, the James Webb Space Telescope found distant planets that might harbor life. Archaeologists claimed to have found mummified aliens. And extraterrestrials even got a shout-out during congressional hearings. No doubt your kids are asking lots of questions, and it could be you're not sure how to answer them. Let me recommend my new book, Is There Anybody Out There? which arrives on Earth on October 3rd. This middle-grade book, based on Season 2 of Wild Thing, explores the question of whether we're alone in the universe using science, humor, and fun illustrations. And it'll leave everyone better prepared for the possibility of alien life. Help kids learn how to tell the difference between science fact and science fiction. Look for Is There Anybody Out There in all bookstores and online. Or for more information, go to wildthingpodcast.com. There are dozens of reported sightings around the U.S. every year. A map I found of all of them between 1921 and 2013 puts the number at well over 3,000. I'd bet a lot of them are not actual sightings, more like stumps, bears, other people, imaginations gone wild. But at least a fraction of them, like the stories we've just heard, are harder for me to dismiss. There should be a better term for these kinds of reports, the maybes. Not verifiable sightings, but encounters you can't put out of your head. That map also doesn't have some of the older reports. 
I found a bunch of 19th century and early 20th century newspaper stories about bear men, monkey men, and wild men. And then, of course, there are the original eyewitness accounts from members of Native American and First Nations tribes. They've got Bigfoot stories that date back to pre-colonial times. The stories of Bigfoot or Klukik or there's stories in each tribe that tell about Bigfoot. So you learn at a young age. All us kids grew up with hearing all the true funny stories of Bigfoot. Harvest Moon is a Quinault Indian and a professional basket weaver and storyteller. She spends part of her summers sharing her tribe's legends and stories at the Lake Quinault Lodge up near Olympic National Park in Washington State. That's Bigfoot territory. So no surprise that Bigfoot is one of her more prominent characters. This monster came out of the brush. His legs were as big as tree trunks. His skin was covered with hair all throughout his body. And his eyes had a hypnotic red glow to him. I had a long conversation with her about Bigfoot, both as part of Native American folklore and as a real flesh-and-blood creature. There are a lot of supernatural elements to tribal Bigfoot stories, which for me blur the line between reality and spirituality. It seems like something of a gray area, but the tribes take Sasquatch very seriously. The name Sasquatch is derived from a word in the Salish tribal language. Other tribes have different names. But when they talk about Bigfoot, it's not like they're talking about Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy. There's almost a reverence to it. I think it's a very spiritual thing when you come face to face with one. She tells me it's happened several times up in that part of Washington. There's about 300, maybe more, 500 people that live past the lake up in the valley. And there's at least a half a dozen to a dozen people that have seen him. And that can be quite an experience. I think it's just something that the when you see a bear in the zoo, Hey, you're, you're pretty comfortable. But when you're out in the woods and you see an animal right face to face, it's quite a bit different. You might have to change your pants because there's cougars, bears, and, you know, predators. Well, when a person actually sees Bigfoot, their disposition changes. She gives me an example of what she means. My son, he was coming up to the lake, and it was a Friday afternoon, summer. A semi-truck passed him, and then as soon as the the semi passed him, Bigfoot, two, three steps, he crossed the road and was across the road. And, uh, And when he got to the cabin, his face was white. And I go, what happened? And he goes, I saw Bigfoot. Her son doesn't go into the woods as much anymore, not like he used to. And this happens a lot in the stories I've heard. People get scared. They lose their wits. They can't overcome the impulse to run. So maybe part of the reason some of these eyewitnesses keep searching is because they were so scared. A desire to seek out the thing that frightens you and try to face it, to understand it. Despite the fact that a Bigfoot sighting seems scary, Harvest Moon tells me that she still hopes she'll see one someday. But she wants it to be by chance. She's not too keen on people actively searching for Bigfoot. We're saddened when so many people are out looking for him. And I think as native of our people, we've kept him as a a neighbor where these people are out, out to catch him and kill him and tear him apart. And I'd just be devastated if somebody would shoot one. I would. It would just be for all. I think I would. I'm speaking for all natives if that ever occurred. Tom Seawood is a member of the Kwakwakiwak, one of the First Nations tribes of Canada. You need to come and sit and consult with the First Nations and ask permission that you can share their family property, the story of a creature. Can I share your family property? Yes, my chief has given me permission to share our family stories with people. So under our laws, I have permission, you have permission to air it. Seawood tells me that Bigfoot is known as Chunakwa to his people, and they've had a long relationship with her. You'd hear chirps and hollering, and whoops. And of course, you knew it was Chunakwa wild woman of the woods, female Sasquatch. And every family has their own story and interpretation of an ancestor seeing that creature. 
This isn't just lore handed down over generations. These are recountings of actual Sasquatch sightings. And Seward has a story too. He's an affable guy with a big grin and eyes that crinkle up when he smiles. He lives out on Vancouver Island and has spent huge chunks of his life in the backwoods. Now he runs ecotourism outfits, taking tourists through abandoned Indian villages. But before this, he worked as a commercial fisherman, harvesting shellfish, crabs, herring. He spent weeks at a time in remote coastal areas. And he has seen some weird stuff out there. Smelled it, too. You get Wallace Yachval, a big stink. And it smells like a person who you know hasn't bathed in who knows how many weeks, if not months. And all of a sudden you breathe as they walk upwind of you and you get that gagging, rotten human odor. Multiply that by 20 and there's your Sasquatch Bigfoot's odor. It'll knock you in your tracks. Yum. He tells me about the time that he and his friend Dean and girlfriend Josie took a fishing trip. After a day out on the water, they anchored their boat just offshore for the night, right as the moon came up. Me and Dean are on deck cooking crabs on a Coleman gas stove, and uh, and then all of a sudden we heard that <laughs> whistle chirp on the beach, and the beach is all lit up with the moonlight. It's just like a white backdrop, and then all of a sudden we saw two big shadows walking, and they were bipedal. And I'm like, Dean, he's, I see it, I see it, Tommy. Sue had ran to find the others playing cards in the boathouse and told them to come take a look. As they stood watching whatever was on the beach, Seward's girlfriend, Josie, smelled something. She goes, oh, the beach stinks tonight. Must be low tide. Dean looked at her and he, he goes, Josie, when have you ever smelled the beach smell like I got at low tide? Besides that, it's high tide right now. I think we got two junoch on the beach. Sasquatch. To get a better view, they flipped on the boat's spotlight. Boom. One in the grass above high tide, one in the cockle bed. Both of them dropped. We tried everything for 20 minutes to try to move them. We were, at one point, I said, hey, Jojo, go get the camera. She comes up, turns it on, and pushes the button. She's like, oh, shoot, no film. Wah, wah. Can I just say that the number of camera malfunctions around Bigfoot is epic? I mean, seriously, why is everyone either out of film or batteries or can't get the damn thing to focus? Asking for a friend. Damn, we get a picture of that thing. And I'm sitting there and I started thinking, you know, that's my lottery ticket. Dean, go grab your rifle. And I grab my 300 Savage and load her up. Because, as we've established, even better than a picture of a Bigfoot would be the actual body of one. And Jojo goes, Tom, you know the curse of your people. You harm or try to kill a Sasquatch or kill it. it might not be you dying violently, but it'd be me and your parents, your sister. So he put his gun up. He didn't shoot. Pretty convenient, you might say. That thought certainly crossed my mind. But I wasn't there. And who's to say if I could pull the trigger? Tom Seward's story is more recent. But Indigenous peoples all over North America have stories of Bigfoot that go back for centuries. Kathy Strain is an anthropologist with the U.S. Forest Service in California. And she manages the Tribal Relations Program for the Stanislaus National Forest. That's her job. But Bigfoot? That's her thing. And she has collected hundreds of these tribal Bigfoot stories. A few are pretty clearly stories about Sasquatch. A lot seem less obvious. And many of them seem to go back and forth between reality and, well, myth. Stories have different purposes, but they're conveying some knowledge. It's meant to teach something. It's not just for entertainment. Most of the time, what you're hearing is a lesson that you need to learn. Okay, so like Aesop's Fables... It strikes me these Sasquatch stories are kind of the same thing. People have always used animals, real and imagined, to tell stories and teach some sort of lesson. Think about fairy tales, witches, magic beanstalks, giants, mermaids, dragons. So how is this any different? If these were fairy tales, if they were like a fairy tale, there'd be more fictional characters. Native American stories, typically, they're always eagle, condor, turtle, things that exist. As she sees it, and as she's been told, these stories serve as a way to teach people about the natural world and how to be safe in it. Being scared of Bigfoot isn't necessarily a bad thing, and running away might just keep you alive. Native Americans were living lives of true life and death. There is no reason to make up something if he's never going to encounter it, because you just wasted time and space. 
So many tribes have references to Sasquatch-like creatures that it's hard to just completely discount them. For comparison, think of all the flood myths out there. Stories of giant floods across Europe, North America, Asia, passed down through generations. They're usually told as creation myths or acts of a vengeful god. But it turns out those myths could be based in reality. Geologists have found evidence of massive floods that happened around 10,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age. Glacial ice dams failed, causing gigantic floods. And voila, an event that explains those stories all around the globe. Or so we think. Maybe there's something similar going on with all these Bigfoot tales. But while there's geologic evidence backing up the great flood stories, Bigfoot is still missing that <clears throat> body of evidence. And yet, these eyewitness accounts, they seem so real, and the people telling them seem so genuine and sane. Kathy Strain is a perfect example of this. She's really smart and really likable, and she's got a hell of a story from an encounter she had in a heavily forested part of eastern Oklahoma. Before we hear it, a note on geography. My research has been focused on the Pacific Northwest, because that's where Grover did his work. But there have been reports of Bigfoot in every state but Hawaii, including Oklahoma, which is where Kathy, her husband, and some friends were exploring an area known for Bigfoot. There were cabins that we were staying at, and we're sitting around in our camp chairs, and we're in like a semicircle. And I have this really good view of this place we call the bottleneck. The only place where you could walk without getting tangled up in briar bushes. We start hearing like something's moving, and then all of a sudden, here comes two big feet, Bigfoot. I don't know if there's a plural for that. Yeah, you and me both, sister. Coming right at us. She saw two of them, one bigger, one smaller. And they didn't seem to realize they'd been spotted. When I saw them, I said, there they are. And I jumped up and I ran at them. They then turned and bolted up the hillside like the fastest thing I've ever seen in my life. You ran towards it? Yeah, I was going to give a big fuzzy hug, I, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, what were you thinking? I don't know what I was thinking. I just reacted. There they are. Give me the opportunity to learn more, see more, and maybe you'll be astonished that this woman's running at you and you'll stop dead in your tracks and I can get to you and pull some hair off or something. I don't know. I, I really don't know. I just reacted. Weren't you scared? I, I mean, I wasn't afraid, not even slightly, but I did have a, a meltdown. I was like... Like, uh, wow, that's more powerful, bigger than I expected. Uh, I don't know if it's okay for us to be here anymore. Strain is the only person I talked to who tried to chase down a Bigfoot. But that fear response clearly caught up with her later. Did she really see Sasquatch? Did anyone? There are a boatload of scientific studies that show people don't always remember things correctly. Memories can be affected by things like stress and fear, and we've seen how Bigfoot creates that reaction. But so could a bear. Even those people who aren't initially thinking, whoa, that's a Bigfoot, like John Mayanzinski, our wildlife biologist guy from the beginning, they can end up coming around to that idea. So despite how fascinating and compelling these stories are, they're just not enough evidence on their own. But before we give up completely on Bigfoot, some good news about those big ground nests. Jeff Meldrum, the anthropology professor from Idaho State who took the samples, we caught up on the phone, and he's raised some money to get at least some of the DNA from those nests analyzed. Rather than dipping into other funds that were tagged for other research projects, I thought, you know, in this day and age, hey, let's try an Indiegogo. And, uh, and we came up with about 40, 4,200. Not too shabby. Doing environmental DNA analysis apparently costs about 1000 bucks a sample. So it should be enough to test about four of them. So who chipped in? Was it just kind of random people or were there? Yeah, well, it was. There were a few bigger donors. There were a lot of $25, $50, $75 donations. And so it's a long list. And there were people from all over the world, too. The UK, Germany, Denmark, I think, was on there. Some that I knew, and many that I didn't. Ah, the magic of the internet. And now the samples are in the hands of Todd Disitel, the molecular primatologist at NYU. 
We connect over an echoey Skype line. I, I got them a few weeks ago. They are right now being extracted. We're in the middle of doing the soil extractions. So this is for the environmental DNA. But I wanted my um, people to use, you know, renewable samples. By this, he means samples he can easily get again, like dirt from the property around his cabin. Before we do something more valuable like Jeff's. And what are the, what are the tests involved? The first step is we basically extract all of the DNA out of the sample. And because this is soil, you know, 99% of that DNA is going to be bacteria. The stuff that's left over, that 1%, it gets enriched to help them tease out the remaining gene sequences. The few percent of sequences that don't directly match the database. This is a database containing the genetic information of all known living species. We actually create an evolutionary tree with those sequences and the sequences that are already known in the database. And then we'll see what they're most closely related to. So obviously we're interested in the mammalian sequences, we're interested in any potential unknown mammalian sequence, particularly primate, and you know, that would be a potential signature of an unknown primate. There could be something interesting here even if it's not Bigfoot. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm very intrigued at what created the nest. I, I find it I would be very shocked if we don't get DNA out of those nests because something to create a nest that large is going to have shed some hair, going to have drooled, you know, peed themselves, pooped, whatever, and left some DNA behind. And while it's a total long shot, what if it is Bigfoot? Consider the idea just for a moment. What a find that would be. Not to mention some redemption for Cousin Grover and all these eyewitnesses we just heard from. But even if it's not a Sasquatch, it could be something really cool and weird. Disatel isn't a Bigfoot guy, and he hasn't seen the nests in person. But even he thinks there's something interesting going on here. And on the next episode of Wild Thing, we'll hear more from him about the modern world of DNA and what it might mean for Bigfoot. Do you want us to witness your love for this show? Leave us a rating wherever you get your podcasts. This really helps us get the word out about Wild Thing. And go to our website, wildthingpodcast.com. That's Wild Thing Podcast, all one word. We're also on the usual social media suspects. Find us at Wild Thing Pod. And if you see Sasquatch in the wild, make sure to snap a photo, blurry or otherwise, and share it using the hashtag Wild Thing Pod. This podcast is a production of Foxtopus Inc. Wild Thing is created, reported, and produced by me, Laura Krantz, with help from Kelsey Ray. Elisa Barba is our editor. Scott Carney is our executive producer. Our music is composed by Ramtin Arablui and mixed by Sanaz Meshkinpour. 